please welcome me in joining to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Keith Slotkin. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I'm really excited to be here today. Uh, my name is Keith Slotkin, and uh, the goal of my talk today is to uh, help us understand some concepts in evolutionary biology, and in my particular field, molecular biology, that can be pretty complex, that can be very hard to think about because it's, it, we can't really see it with our naked eye. So these are co complex ideas. And to do that, I thought I'd use an analogy an analogy to something to make it more accessible and to something that we all understand, and that's to an arms race in the political sense. And that's where the title comes from today, a molecular arms race. So rapid escalation of weapons and defenses, not between nations, but in the biological world. So what is an arms race in the political sense? Well, you guys all know this, but an arms race is a, is a conflict between two or more parties with the goal of having superior forces and weapons. And the important part here is this re leads to a rapid escalation. And I'll get back to that in a minute. But in the cartoon, we have an arms race between the cop and the robber. The cop might start off with the billy stick, but he's outgunned by the robber. So the robber has the upper hand in this situation. So the cop, in order to pull even with the, with the robber, has to go out and get a gun himself. The robber then, to get the upper hand, gets a, a better gun, maybe a semi-automatic. The cop has to do the same. The robber gets the machine gun. The cop counters with the machine gun, and now the robber has a rocket launcher. <laughs> the point here, and, and the important point for the talk, is that we've gone from a billy stick to a rocket launcher in a very quick amount of time, much faster than we would have if there was no conflict. Right? The, the arms race is what propelled the technology and propelled the weaponry. So, there is no absolute goal here. The goal of the robber was not to have a rocket launcher. The goal is just to stay one step ahead. And that's important, that's, a, that's gonna be an important concept in evolutionary biology here. So the goal is to remain one step ahead, uh, and so there's no absolute goal, only a relative goal. So this is the second time I've used this analogy in a talk. The first time was actually in this room about a year ago at the Cavalry Frontiers meeting. And, and in this meeting, I had to explain what I work on in very broad terms to uh, a group of uh, South Korean researchers. So I thought, well, I want to start with an analogy because that's how I can make things easier. And I thought, well, arms race, if you live on the Korean Peninsula, you probably are very familiar with the, uh, the concept of an arms race. However. Analogies have good points and bad points, and the good point is they can make things easier to understand. The bad things that can be taken way out of context. That that analogy, uh, that talk, sorry, that I gave a year ago has now been put on the web. It's been referenced a number of times, and it's opened up a whole new level of spam for me. <laughs> so. This is one of many invitations that I now get to come talk at the Cold War Studies Institute. Um, we encourage submission by students working on any aspect of the Cold War, broadly defined. They would be very upset if I showed up, right? I work on plant genomes and transposable elements, as I'll get to later in the talk. They would be, uh, they would be very upset when I came. So this is the last time this talk I will use this analogy. I will retire it at the end of the hour. OK. So arms races occur between nations, but they also occur in the biological world. right? And this leads not to new new weapons and new technology, but we don't use those terms really in, in biology. We use uh, new traits and behaviors, but you can think of them like weapons and technologies. And we use words like pathways and mechanisms that evolve over time. So in the example I'm gonna give of, the first example I'm gonna give of an evolutionary arms race uh, is gonna be on the organismal level, right? So the really great thing about evolutionary concepts is they can happen on the ecosystem level, they can happen on the organismal level or on the cellular, molecular, or even subatomic level with protein uh, uh, evolution. And so the concepts remain the same no matter what level you're looking at. This level is easier to, look, to think about because we can see these organisms and we already understand these relationships compared to the molecular or cellular world where I, where I work. So this newt um, is stuck in an evolutionary arms race. This newt obviously has no shell, has no claws, isn't particularly fierce. This is a really easy meal, right, for a predator. Now, 
the newt has a defense against being eaten, and that's, that is that it produces a very large amount of this toxin. So if an animal eats it, that animal will remember not to eat that uh, organism again, or not to eat that species again. So um, the idea here, and what perplexed scientists for a long time, is it wasn't, this newt wasn't producing a small amount or even a, a, a normal moderate amount of this toxin. It was producing this enormous level of this toxin, enough to kill not one predator, but to kill the whole family of predators. And the reason we now understand why it's producing so much of this toxin is that it's stuck in an evolutionary arms race with its predator, this snake, right? So this snake obviously wants to eat the newt. Um, and now this is difficult to understand, but a long time ago for us in our lifespan and our daily schedule and our reproductive cycle, but very recently evolutionarily, right? Those things are on different time span. Evolution happens over millions of years. So in a blink of an eye evolutionarily, this newt was started not being toxic, then started to develop this toxin. The snake now couldn't eat the newt and the snake wanted to. So the snake evolved a small amount of resistance to this toxin. Well, then the newt didn't want to be eaten, had to develop a little more toxin. And the snake had to become a little bit more resistant, and more toxic, more resistant. And in a blink of an eye evolutionarily, we get to the point where we are today, where this newt produces huge amounts of this toxin, and the snake can handle huge amounts of this toxin. <laughs> so this, the situation today is that the snake can eat the newt, right? But the snake is comatose for a number of hours dealing with all of this toxin, <laughs> getting the toxin out of its body, right? This is... So the point here is that rapidly in evolutionary terms here, in, in the evolutionary time scale, this uh, has gotten kind of uh, out of hand. This has gotten to a very uh, elevated, uh, escalated state. So in my talk today, I'm going to talk a lot about these predator-prey relationships or host-parasite or host-pathogen relationships. This analogy is best in I study relationships uh, in the biological world of, of organisms or parasites at war with each other, right? I don't want you to leave here thinking that everything is at war with each other. So I stuck this one slide in here to, just to remind you that I'm using this example because it's easy to understand these evolutionary ideas, but, but it, there are great examples of organisms that co-evolve and coexist. Uh, uh, it, for example, this flower uh, has evolved to have its flower look or uh, receive the hummingbird's beak in perfect shape, right? These, these things are co-evolving together. But for the concept of the talk today, it's easier to think of uh, that it's a war out there. And this brings me to um, an idea that evolutionary biologists like called the red queen effect. The red queen effect, it, is a, 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 um, it originally comes from Carol's Through the Looking Glass, Alice in Wonderland. And the idea here is that in this scene, Alice is running, but she's not going anywhere. And she says, well, in our country, still panting a little, you generally get somewhere else if you run very fast for a long time, as we've been doing. And the Red Queen retorts, a slow sort of country. Now here you see it takes all the running you can do just to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. This section of this book has been uh, first by this um, evolutionary biologist, but now many evolutionary biologists have kind of taken this idea, taken this quote, and run with it. And we now call this the Red Queen effect. And I think it's important here because evolution, you know, we, we can't see evolution on our daily basis, or we can't see evolution even within our lifespans. But we are evolving as a species, and all the species around us are evolving as well. And so we're marching through time, not a time span we can really comprehend, but we're marching through evolutionary time at a particular clip, and we have to evolve at that clip. We're moving forward evolutionarily. If we stop evolving, soon we won't be able to compete with the other organisms around us. But that constant evolution is essentially just keeping us in place compared to the other organisms around us, because they're evolving too. If we want to actually go out there and create, uh, create a weapon in the biological sense, right? Or if we want to create a new trait or uh, the ability to um, uh, become resistant to a particular virus, for example, we can't just run. We have to sprint, as the queen suggests, right? 
It's, it's, it's not enough to go uh, at the steady clip. We need to turn up that speed. The, way I, the analogy I like here, the way I like to think about this is you're, you're using your DVR to watch a movie, right? Or, or watch a TV show. And you're watching it at its normal pace where it makes sense. And you're gonna get from one place in that movie to another at a normal pace. And that's the, the rate of evolution that is, is kind of keeping constant. Now, when you're stuck in an evolutionary arms race, what happens is natural selection presses the fast forward button a couple times. 2x, 4x, 8x, 16x, and now we're really flying, right? We're going through that movie extremely quickly. And that's what uh, evolutionary arms races really do. They, they can alter two different variables, the two variables in um, in, in evolutionary speed, which is the rate at which an organism is, is, has, has variation or mutation or, or a change, and then the rate of selection upon that change. So arms races can occur on the organismal level, like I showed you between the uh, newt and the snake, but they can also occur on the molecular level. So here, all I've done is I've changed the cop and robber with a human cell and a virus, right? The human cell could maybe is susceptible to attack by this virus because this virus has a weapon. The, so the human cell either is going to die or evolutionary have to adapt, uh, and it will adapt to have a counter defense. Well, then the virus, which evolves very quickly because it constantly wants to exploit the resources of this human cell, it will go out and get a better weapon, and the human cell has to adapt to that and evolve to that. And again, in a short amount of time, you've gone from having, in this case, no defenses to having uh, a large amounts of defenses and, and new weaponry by the virus. So the idea here is that in all of our cells, we're constantly going through this evolutionary arms race, not with other organisms, sometimes with other organisms, but more frequently with parasites and pathogens and viruses things that want to infect, get into our cells and use the, the, the energy and the resources of those cells for their, own gain, for their own benefit or their own gain, to replicate themselves at the expense of the host cell, in this case, which is the human cell. The human cell obviously doesn't want that. It wants to keep its resources for its, uh, itself uh, and it tries to fend off these parasites and pathogens. So again, just to, to, re, to hit the point home, this is a rapid escalation of traits and functions where both the host cell and the pathogen are both, both trying as hard as they can to have a replicative advantage, to replicate better than the other one. And, and this puts them at odds with each other. And again, this is a rapid evolution of new traits and functions. So in this slide, on the right-hand side here, we have uh, the life cycle of a virus, very simplified life cycle of a virus. And the point of this slide is that in every point of the viral life cycle, the host organism, let's say the human cell, is trying to fight that virus. So the virus starts off as a piece of DNA. That's the, the blueprint of the organism. It's gonna go through this process of transcription to produce viral RNA. This is the intermediate molecule where lots of really interesting regulation takes place. That RNA is then translated into a viral protein, and that viral protein will go out and do some work. For example, help replicate the virus. So the host cell is actually trying at every single point of this life cycle to stop the virus. I'm just using a virus as an example here. We could talk about any other type of pathogen or parasite. So it's trying to, the, the host cell is trying to degrade the viral DNA, trying to block the process of transcription, trying to degrade the viral RNA or block translation or even degrade viral protein. And the goal here is to destroy that virus. The goal here is to clear the cell, not let that virus replicate. But even in a case where the virus is only 1% successful, that 1% can be enough because that 1% of production of that viral protein uh, can have massive effects. Now, some viral proteins are out to replicate the virus directly. They, they help in that process of transcription and translation. Other viral proteins are, are, are a little bit, um, it's more indirect how they help the virus. So for example, this viral protein, it's not out directly to replicate uh, the virus and help the virus life cycle, but it's working actually uh, to inhibit the host defenses, right? This is the idea that sometimes the best offense is a good defense. And so the, vir the, the, the viral protein can inhibit all of these different host mechanisms to repress the virus, and thus in a secondary way, restore the, the activity or restore the life cycle of the virus. 
And these proteins are basically in all good pathogens, parasites, and viruses. They all carry these things. Sometimes they're called effector proteins. Sometimes they're called viral silencing repressors. It doesn't matter what they're actually called. But, but as we'll see in the upcoming example, all of these proteins, or sorry, all of these um, parasites and pathogens carry these to not only um, uh, go on the offensive and try to replicate that parasite or pathogen, but also try to block the host defenses. And that's an important uh, idea that will come up later as well. So when these authors or anyone else goes out and looks at what genes, the, the, what these authors did, they looked at what genes in the human genome are sprinting evolutionarily, which ones are evolving at the absolute fastest pace, right? They can do this by comparing the human and the chimpanzee genome. And what they find is the exact same thing you would find if you looked in a mouse, if you looked in an invertebrate, if you looked in a plant or a fungal organism. What you would see is that the top sprinting genes in any organism are always the immunity and defense genes here. Those are the genes that are constantly locked in this evolutionary arms race. So that's the fastest evolving part of us, or fastest evolving part of any organism. The genes responsible for fending off the pathogens, because that's the evolutionary arms race at work. So the question here is, why do scientists study arms races? It's because evolution happens over millions of years. And in my lifespan, or in my research active career, or in my grant cycle, or in my publication cycle, I have a hard time studying something that takes millions of years, right? And so sometimes, sometimes scientists purposely do this, and sometimes they uh, unknowingly do this, but they, they end up working uh, on what works fastest, on what provides data fastest. And in this case, arms races are sprinting. They are moving incredibly quickly evolutionarily, and they make really good tools for us to work in the lab. Now sometimes, let's use the virus and, and human cell example, sometimes scientists are using the virus and the human cell to find out how they interact. But sometimes scientists aren't even particularly interested in the virus, but they just want to find out basic mechanisms of how the human cell works. But they might use the virus, because if they can find out how the virus is exploiting or blocking the, those host defense mechanisms, those, those systems within the human cell, they can find out a lot about the human cell itself. And so in the, next couple, in the next two slides, I want to provide examples of scientists that have used this host-parasite relationship uh, and this arms race to, to, to find out amazing things about biology and, and to do it with uh, a lot of speed. Um, the first one is from uh, a while ago, but I thought it was uh, important because this is the Benzer lecture, right? And we can talk about the research career of Seymour Benzer because he used this extremely well. So Seymour Benzer uh, has had multiple almost research careers all in one lifetime. I'm only going to talk about one of them here. And in that one of them, he worked on a host parasite relationship between bac a bacteria called E. coli and a bacteriophage here, which is like a virus of E. coli. So we always think of E. coli as a pathogen or, or, or uh, something that, that uh, infects us, like a foodborne illness. But we're not talking in this case about humans. We're talking about E. coli and E. coli's natural parasite or viral pathogen, and that is something called bacteriophage, which destroys E. coli cells. All organisms have their own parasites, right? So what Benzer did uh, was Benzer was particularly interested in, not necessarily in bacteriophage or not necessarily in E. coli, he just wanted to understand fundamentally what is a gene, right? What does a gene look like? But he used this because of its powerful uh, uh, efficiency and its speed. So what he was able to do is he looked at um, uh, a particular trait in the DNA of this bacteriophage sitting on the coat of an um, E. coli cell called R. And R um, stood for rapid and rapid death of the host. So when this gene was functional, E. coli was no match for the bacteriophage. Now we could have R mutants which little r uh, and italics, and what that did is that now the host or the E. coli cell survived. So this was now an inefficient bacteriophage virus. And so what he was able to do is, is use several things to his benefit. One, this is a host parasite relationship. And two, these are tiny, tiny, tiny little microorganisms. So he was able to, on individual Petri dishes, screen thousands, if not millions, of host parasite battles going on all at the same time, and then spread them out on a Petri dish and pick the ones that were most interesting to him. 
And he, again, he wasn't particularly interested in, in this relationship. He just wanted to understand what a gene looked like. So the, one of his key contributions was the, the amazing speed that he could work in here. I should also mention that uh, I forgot here that what he could do is he could look at individuals of bacteriophage that had the rapid death of their host, and then he could screen for mutants in which they no longer could kill their host, our mutants. And then once he had our mutants, he could then rescreen and find individuals of the bacteriophage that reverted back to rapid death of the host. And he could figure out what was going on uh, in, on the chromosome or the, the, the DNA of this bacteriophage in order to uh, restore or lose function of this trait. And it's hard to understand what he, he really found because it's so basic to our scientific understanding now, but it wasn't back in the, in the 50s, right? In the 50s, they, they had this linear stretch of piece of DNA, and they thought, they thought genes were individual points along that piece of DNA. What Benzer showed was that they weren't points, they were actually regions. Regions of DNA that could have a recombination, for example, or mutations within them. This is, I mean, this is textbook bio, bio 101 now. It's, it's uh, completely rudimentary or fundamental in our understanding of, uh, of any kind of genome. In addition, Benzer was able to uh, characterize the different types of mutations that can be found to turn uh, normal R to, to mutant R or mutant R back to normal R. And he created the nomenclature, the lingo that we still use to define the types of mutations. So in this particular example, here's someone that only worked in the system for a couple of years, but made huge seminal discoveries using this host parasite relationship uh, and this evolutionary arms race that, that goes on. And basically he could do evolution in a, a week, a day, a night with these incredibly fast moving organisms. Okay, a, a much more recent example comes from Nature Magazine two weeks ago. And in Nature two weeks ago, they're uh, talking little snippets from the news, of the, the, the news of the scientific world, and they're talking about Ebola. Who's not talking about Ebola in the scientific world, right? And so Ebola, which kills up to 90% of people it infects, is known to disrupt the activity of interferon, a crucial antiviral protein. These people at Wash U in St. Louis uh, found that Ebola, uh, Ebola viral protein blocks the transport of an interferon-activated protein called STAT1 into the nucleus. STAT1 is needed in the nucleus to stimulate defense mechanisms. So what, this, what, what these researchers showed and, and why it was such a kind of interesting and timely uh, piece of data was why is, he, they're asking the question, why is Ebola such a darn good virus? Why is it so effective at killing human cells? Well, the, the reason, at least one of the reasons it is, is that normally when a virus infects a cell, there's an alarm system that goes off in the cell. And, and it sounds the alarm and all these defenses get activated to go out and, and, and try to calm the virus, to try to kill the virus, uh, try to put up the defense mechanisms. The very first thing that Ebola does when it enters the cell is it cuts the alarm, right? It cuts the alarm system, interferon, in the cell and the cell can no longer sound the alarm. And so Ebola has a, a lot of time within the cell with, before the alarm system is triggered to go out and, and wreak havoc. The cell has a very delayed or slow response to the fact that it's being infected. So again, this is a, 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 this is a host parasite relationship. Uh, an evolutionary arms race uh, for this particular virus. And this virus um, isn't playing fair, right? It doesn't just have proteins out to uh, replicate itself. It has proteins out to specifically block our cell's defenses. Obviously, we can't wait you know, for the machine gun here for the, for, the, for the cop, right? We can't wait to evolutionarily catch up with Ebola, right? That, that's going to take a million years. We need to obviously be much more proactive as a community about Ebola. So with that, what I thought I would do is, is transition away from this long introduction of why scientists study arms races and start to transition into my own research and the arms race that I work on. And how I'm going to start that is with the basic question of what's between the genes. If we look at any genome, it, what we think it looks like is this. The picture in our mind is this. So we have a piece of DNA here, this white line in the back, and we have regions of this DNA that encode for particular genes. These, are the, these hold the traits, the heritable traits, uh, and eventually will make proteins. There's five different genes here shown. This is, some genomes look like this. In fact, this would be an accurate representation of the yeast genome. Yeast is a single cell organism, right? 
Our genome much, looks much more like this, right? There's still stretches, there's still genes, but the region in between the genes is huge. Only 2 to 3 percent of our DNA encodes for proteins. Now, proteins get all the, new, they get all the press, right? Everybody's studying them. Uh, sorry, 2 to 3 percent of the genome encodes for genes, but genes get all the press. Genes are what everyone studies, but they're a minority of, of substance, of component in the genome. The majority of stuff in the genome is what we call intergenic DNA, or the stuff between the DNA, or what a lot of people refer to as junk DNA. Junk DNA, because when they sequence an organism, or human for example, they want the genes, they don't really want this stuff in between. We had to sequence it to get from one gene to another. In fact, there's lots of techniques now out there to resequence human genomes and only get the genes and forget about the stuff in the middle, because that's the junk, right? So I study the junk DNA. I study the stuff between the genes. I study a type of stuff between the genes that are shown here as triangles. And these are called transposable elements. You heard of this word in the introduction. Transposable elements, most people have never heard of a transposable element. But a transposable element drawn here as a triangle uh, is part of this intergenic DNA. I'll get to the rest of this definition in a minute. But what happens is this piece of, you know, if this is to scale, then this piece of DNA here is inserted into that position right there between the genes. That's, that's why they're drawn as triangles always. Genes are always drawn as, as rectangles or squares, and um, triangles are for transposable elements. So what is a transposable element? Often abbreviated as TE. It's an intergenic fragment. I just showed you that. It's between the genes. And when it's expressed, it has this trick. Here's a transposable element on one of your chromosomes. It's the green chromosome in this example. A transposable element can duplicate itself to a new position in the genome, to the yellow chromosome. This is fundamentally different than a gene. A gene cannot do this. If we have a gene at a particular location in our genome, it's at the same position in the chimp genome. It's at the same position in the orangutan genome. It's at the same position in the mouse genome, because all of it all evolved from a common ancestor and a common uh, genome. Transposable elements aren't at that same position. They move around. They're much more dynamic, much, uh, much more uh, evolutionary dynamic as well than compared to the genes. So transposable elements are these pieces between the genes that can move around and reshuffle and, and jump around. So they're present in nearly all eukaryotic genomes, particularly all multicellular eukaryotes. Sorry, but they occupy half of your DNA, right? Genes, remember, only occupy 2 to 3 percent of your DNA. So you have a lot more transposable element in you than you do genes. That's what's between all of your genes. Now, where did you get your transposable elements from? Well, the same place you got the rest of your DNA from, your parents, right? They had transposable elements in their genome. They passed it on to you, and you will pass it on to your children. That's called vertical descent, because it goes through time and through generations, right? So it's somewhat useful to consider a transposable element like a virus. What's the purpose of a transposable element? Why is it in the genome? Well, it's not like a gene. It's not out to help your reproduction, to help your life, to help prevent disease. It's not out to benefit you in any way. It's a piece of selfish DNA, just like a virus is, that wants to make more of itself. It wants to copy itself over and over again and produce as many copies of it as it can. It's like a computer virus in that sense, with no function, just out to copy itself. But the analogy to a virus breaks down because it, it's not like a virus. It can't leave the cell. It can't do what we call horizontal transfer, meaning that you can't catch a transposable element from someone. It can't leave the cell. You can catch a virus, right, through body fluid, for example, but you can't catch a transposable element. So the point here is that transposable elements, there's an inherent danger in them. And the danger is this. Watch this transposable element located here. It's going to move. And in that movement, there's a problem there, is to get integrated into this chromosome here, it had to break the chromosome to get itself in. It copy, it, it, in this case, it copy, uh, cut and paste. In the other example, it copied and paste. But it inserted itself into the genome. And any time a transposable element moves, it has to break DNA. And anything that breaks DNA, UV, X-rays, anything that breaks DNA, we can think of as a mutagen, meaning it causes mutations in the genome because DNA isn't always repaired correctly. So we like to think of transposable elements as the pathogen or the, or the, the mutagen from within. 
It's latent in all of our bodies. Our cells spend a lot of energy trying to keep them inactive, right? Transposable elements in our genome are no problem for us as long as they're not actively jumping around. When they start actively jumping around, we have real problems. Because active transposable elements, the ones that are actually jumping, cause all sorts of instability in our genomes. They break chromosomes, which is really a problem. Uh, that can create uh, in humans all sorts of disorders, and it's associated with the progress progression of all sorts of diseases. For example, the progression of cancer is highly uh, associated with activation of transposable elements and then moving around, starting to jump around. So back in the common ancestor of plants, animal, and fungi, when all life on Earth was single cellular, two billion years ago, mechanisms started to evolve to say, Oh, that's a transposable element in our genome. That's not a gene. That's a transposable element. Find it, repress it, silence it, so it's no longer jumping around. And so today, we still, in all multicellular organisms, have these mechanisms to, uh, to stop transposable element activity. So the arms race I work on is this one. I think of the transposable element as the robber. The transposable element is out to duplicate itself. That's what it wants to do. It wants to jump to all corners of your genome and occupy as much of your genome as possible. The cell doesn't want that. That's inherently mutagenic. The cell really wants to, to, to maintain its genome in good state. So the cell uh, works hard to silence transposable element activity. The cell can't erase the transposable element out of the genome. That's not possible. But what the cell can do is at least stop the transposable element from jumping around, therefore making it latent. And, and we don't really have a problem passing silenced or dead transposable elements on from generation to generation. The problem comes when they're, when they're active like this. Right, so that, that's, that's the, 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 the arms race that I work on, the transposable element versus the host. I don't know which one's which. I like to think of my cell as the cop and the transposable element as the robber, although I have met plenty of people who uh, argue the other way around. Now, to make things more complicated, I don't work with humans. I don't work with the human genome. Humans are very difficult to work with in multiple senses, right? <laughs> I work in a plant. I work in a little tiny plant called Arabidopsis thaliana. It's what we call a model organism, right? And I'm a big proponent of model organisms. The idea behind a model organism, and there, here's, the, here's the best model organisms, the fruit fly, Drosophila, the worm, C. elegans, the budding yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, Arabidopsis thaliana, the plant. Those organisms, well, the problem is um, with humans, one, humans have a huge genome. They have a genome that's enormous in size because of all those transposable elements. Its genome would fit into the obese category. It's very difficult to work with. Embedded in there are, are a bunch of very important genes, but it's, it's, not a, a, it's a very large genome. Um, that's one problem with humans. Uh, two, it's very hard to get samples of humans. Um, there's all sorts of privacy concerns, lots of paperwork. Try to avoid that. Um, and, it, and third, you can't do genetics with a human. And what I mean by genetics is the verb genetics. When I do genetics in the laboratory, I take that individual. Hey, that's an interesting female. Hey, that's an interesting, an interesting male. I wonder what their progeny looks like, right? And then I get to look at their progeny, right? I can't do the control meeting in humans, right? <laughs> um, so the, 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 probably the fourth problem is I need numbers. Right? I need large amounts of numbers when I do genetics. And even in, you know, I, I want a, an individual uh, organism that's a model organism to produce thousands of offspring. That makes things scientifically, uh, statistically uh, significant, right? The, the more numbers, better statistics. And it really rare events I can capture. But let's use mouse, for example. If mouse has a large litter, it's 12. 12 is not a very big statistical number. 25,000 is, right? And, and we'll get to that number in a minute. So Arabidopsis is this um, very, so the idea with model organisms, sorry to jump ahead there, the idea with model organisms is all life comes from a single source, right? Four billion years ago. And about two billion years ago, plants, animal, and fungi all had a common ancestor, a common uh, uh, genome. And that cell did things like respiration, it protected itself against transposable elements, it did a whole bunch of other things that uh, our cells still do. So instead of studying something that takes a long time and is difficult to do in, in a human or a mouse, 
Uh, we can do it in a much simpler system where we can work extremely quickly and extremely efficiently to figure out the basic mechanism and then do what's called translate that information up to a more complicated uh, organism, a mouse or even a human that has, uh, that maybe it has medical implications. And, and do, using these model organisms, we can move much faster than trying to identify that mechanism originally, let's say, in a mouse, a chimp, or a human. Much more difficult. So Arabidopsis is really great. It's obviously very small, as you can see there. It's very fast and inexpensive to grow. Uh, I can outfit an entire room to grow Arabidopsis with a credit card in Lowe's, right? It's, it's nothing, no special equipment. Um, it's got a large family size. Each plant can produce sometimes 25,000 offspring. It, one plant, right? So, so numbers are great, statistics are wonderful. Uh, and even if something occurs at a very rare event, one in 5,000, well, that would be really hard in, in a mouse genetic situation, right? But with the plant, that just means that we get four, and we can screen for those four per plant. Not a, not a problem. It's got a tiny genome, and it's fully sequenced. Part of its reason it has such a small genome is that it has a small amount of transposable elements. It's very easy to transform. What that means is I can produce a custom piece of DNA in the laboratory and get it into the Arabidopsis genome very easily and very efficiently. It's got great mutant collections. Uh, we have catalogs. I go like this, the book. They're not books, they're online. Um, we can look at catalogs. Every single gene has a mutation that we can just order by a catalog number. It shows up a couple days later in the mail. Uh, very cheap, very uh, easy to, to order a mutation in any gene. Um, and it's got great genomic resources, which I won't talk about. But people have, have picked this, they've picked the fruit fly, they've picked the worms, C. elegans, and yeast as these organisms that just have all sorts of tools available that they can just fly in. They can go super fast with research, understand mechanism, discover things, and then take those concepts to more complicated uh, situations and organisms. The real reason I use this plant is down here. It is viable with genome-wide activation of transposable elements. So what does that mean? I can take this organism and, using a series of tricks, activate all of the transposable elements in its genome. Right? They all start jumping around. It's chaos for a genome. Now, the plant isn't happy about this, but it survives, and it can get, gen it can get from generation to generation. An animal cell would not allow this. An animal cell, for example, a mouse embryo would be embryonic lethal, right? The mouse cell or an animal, particularly a primate cell, there's so many checkpoints for the integrity of the genome that one of those checkpoints would fail and the, and the animal would abort, right? So this is really useful for me, that I can do uh, uh, essentially terrible things to a plant and no one really cares. Um, <laughs> So the idea is that, uh, so, so, so people often ask me, well, why can the plant handle this kind of you know, chromosome instability, right? Plants can handle extra chromosomes, broken chromosomes, all sorts of transposable element activity, where the, the animal basically can't. It, it, we have a couple trisomies in, in humans that, that are viable. Right? But, but they have severe phenotypes. But at the same time, you've never heard of those other trisomies because th there would be embryonic lethal. It just can't handle a lot of chromosomal ab uh, abnormalities. Well, the, the, the reason why we think that, that, that the plant, in general, plants can handle more stress, and plants can, we know that plants can handle more radiation, more UV stress, more heat stress. The reason plants can do this is, is evolutionarily, if you're an animal and you're catching a lot of, let's just say, UV stress or heat stress, what do you do? You go find a tree to sit under. You go find a cave. You escape the stress. The plant can't. The plant is rooted there. The plant has to sit there and take it, right? And so evolutionarily, the sit there and take it mentality has made the plant have all sorts of ways to deal with huge amounts of stress that the animals haven't had to deal with. Part of that is dealing with all sorts of chromosomal problems. That's what these transposable elements make. And uh, this is wonderful that I can uh, really activate transposable elements and see what happens in the plant genome when in the animal genome this essentially is, is uh, mostly lethal and it's very hard to work on something that's dead. So back in, um, uh, back a couple of years ago now, I had an amazing opportunity to work with a guy named Damon Lish. He was my uh, graduate mentor, right? He, uh, when I was in graduate school, I worked every day with Damon. And so we had this mentor-trainee relationship. And now 15, 12, I can't really remember how many years later, I have gotten to come back and work with this person, not as a, a trainee, but as an equal. And this has been a real 
highlight of my career because Damon's an incredible individual, incredibly enthusiastic about science. And he and I wrote this book chapter uh, that this talk kind of comes from, and it's called Strategies for Silencing and Escape, the Ancient Struggle Between Transposable Elements and Their Hosts. And in this book chapter, we were able to outline all of the different ways that we currently understand that, that, that the host cell tries to silence and repress transposable element activity. And then all the different ways the transposable element tries to skirt around that, tries to avoid that repression. And we gave them fun names, right? Like be a wolf in a sheep's clothing. That was our idea for a lot of transposable elements try to hide the fact that they're a transposable element. They tried to, they tried to masquerade as a gene, trying not to be silenced. So that was the, the wolf in the sheep's clothing. And the one I'm gonna tell you about, I'm gonna tell you a short research story from my lab about how we're using these concepts, and, and it falls under this last one of take a hostage. Using again this, this, this um, arms race uh, analogy to, uh, you know, uh, basically give you a hostage situation. Okay, so I already showed this slide once, but this was the life cycle. Now instead of a virus, I'm writing in here a transposable element. And the transposable element has its replication cycle, which is dependent on its DNA, transcribing to RNA, and making protein. And then the transposable element can, can duplicate itself and jump from position to position. But the host cell acts at every single different level here to stop the transposable element. But the one I'm going to tell you about today is the transposable or the host cell acts to stop transposable element RNA. So RNA that can make RNA that can make a protein is called mRNA, and it is a long single-stranded molecule, right, of RNA, and in it it has the code to encode a protein. So what the host cell does is the host cell finds transposable element RNAs and tries to chop them up into little pieces. It's called dicing, right? The protein that does it, I'll show you, is called dicer because it dices, right? There's another one called slicers, and they slice and they dice. Um, and so the, the RNAs get diced up into small little fragments. And so those small little fragments can't make an, a protein anymore. So in this way, the cell is acting to repress the transposable element's activity by chewing up or degrading and dicing up its RNA. This is the pathway of that. It's called RNAi for RNA interference. RNAi was discovered when I was in graduate school. It's already been awarded the Nobel Prize. One of the coolest things about biology right now is how the pace of it is incredible, right? You have discoveries that you see that, that completely change biology. There's one going through um, biology right now called CRISPR-Cas, right? This is something that I first heard about three or four years ago, and now it's just everywhere, and it's just changing the face of biology. It's amazing how fast these uh, things can sweep through. Basically, RNAi is a mechanism where the, the, it's the host cell evolved this back in the common ancestor of plants, animal, and fungi to find transposable element and viral RNAs and degrade them so they can't produce proteins. And so the, the way you can find them is the fact that viruses and transposable elements have a propensity to make something called double-stranded RNA. So a gene that makes an mRNA, it's a single strand of RNA, and that can make a protein. But transposable elements and viruses tend to make double-stranded RNAs, which base pair together through complementarity. If you haven't heard those words, it's, it, it's not terribly important for this talk. But the fact is, is that viruses and transposable elements make this double-stranded RNA, and there's a surveillance mechanism in the cell to find that and destroy it and to dice it up, to chop it up into what are called small RNAs. And so therefore, this, protein, uh, sorry, this RNA can no longer make a protein because it's not in its long form. It's all chopped up. So the reason this is such a cool pathway, you know, there's lots of RNA degradation pathways in the cell, but the reason this is the coolest one in my eyes is that these products of this degradation aren't just the end product of degradation in some reaction. They actually start off uh, the next cycle of RNA degradation. These degradation products uh, have a second life. And that life is to get incorporated into other proteins uh, and drive the next round of, of targeting for what should be made into double-stranded RNA and what should be then degraded as well. So it does that by base pairing. If, if you haven't heard that uh, of, of base pairing of nucleic acids, that's OK. The mechanism here is not terribly important. Just understand that there's a, a process called, called RNAi that degrades transposable element RNAs. And these small RNAs can then go find RNAs that they match and degrade them further. So let's see that pathway in action. So here's a, we're in a cell now. Here's the nucleus where the DNA is kept. 
if a transposable element expresses, that's the blue arrow, it's, the cell is going to identify it for what it is, a transposable element RNA, and to block it from making a protein, it's going to degrade it by RNAi into these small RNAs. Furthermore, those small RNAs are, can be used to target other transposable element mRNAs for degradation. Here's the other transposable element RNAs. They're blue. The, this blue small RNA matches these blue, this blue RNAs, and so these then become degraded and into small RNAs themselves. This is how the cell is acting to degrade RNA from transposable elements. On the other hand, the gene, oops, sorry, I went too far there. The gene, when that's transcribed, produces a long RNA. It doesn't match this. It's not blue. It's red. And so it's not attacked by RNAi. So it can go on and make a protein. And this is how it keeps the genes making proteins, and it makes the transposable elements degrade their RNA. This is a this was a this is a gun basically that the, the 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 cells evolved, a tool, a weapon that the cells evolved to selectively degrade the transposable element RNAs, but not to degrade the gene RNAs. Now, what's the counter defense? So about 10 years ago, when sequencing several genomes, uh, not just myself, but many people in the field realized that if you look at the structure of a transposable element here, um, sometimes you have these rainbow regions, right? These regions uh, that, that, that it's, not a, it's not part of the transposable element shown here in this uh, yellowish color, but it's parts of other things that have been brought into the transposable element. Let me, let me show you. Transposable elements, we now know go through this process called transduplication. That's a fancy word. We don't really understand how this happens, but we know that it does happen. And it takes fragments of genes. Here's gene 1, gene 2, and gene 3. And little fragments of those genes get incorporated into the transposable element. Not the whole gene, just little pieces of the gene. And so people didn't know why it was doing this. They could see that it was picking up pieces of genes, the transposable element, and the transposable element was selecting for them. It was useful. There was, there was evidence of positive evolutionary selection on the, from, uh, for these regions in the transposable element. So they were doing something, but we didn't understand what they were doing. So one idea was that, well, maybe it was like, you know, the, the transposable element was playing uh, Dr. Frankenstein, right? And it was trying to put together a new protein by grabbing the boot from that gene and the head from that one and the brain from that one and trying to tie it all together as some sort of new gene. That may happen in one or two cases, but I think it's pretty clear now from the data that that's not happening in the majority of the cases. So my lab became very interested in why this was, why this was happening. Um, and here's what, here was our hypothesis, right? Our hypothesis was, I've showed you this slide before, but now the transposable element has, has duplicated a small fraction uh, portion of this red gene into the transposable element. Our hypothesis was that when that transposable element was expressed, it would now have a portion of it that matches that gene in its RNA. Upon RNAi, and it's being chewed up, it now has a little fragment, a small RNA, that isn't similar to transposable elements like these other blue ones, but it's similar to this gene. And so when that gene was expressed, that small RNA would then target that gene instead of a transposable element for degradation. Right? And we wanted to figure out if this was actually happening. This is happening through the trans-silencing nature of RNAi. That's a fancy way of saying small RNAs don't only, have to ha don't only have to work on transcripts that produced them. They can also work on other transcripts that they happen to match. So one of my goals in the talk today was actually to get through this long introduction and actually show you some real publication data from the lab. And that's why this slide has a different color background, right? This is uh, data from my lab um, that uh, is directly out of a publication. And what we're doing in this, uh, in this data, uh, in this figure, is we're looking at the level of this red RNA, of a gene's RNA. We have a digital ways to measure the amount of that RNA. And we're doing it for a particular gene. Uh, and here's the name of the gene. It's one of the 24,000 genes in the plant. And so uh, here we go. We're just going to look at the level of that gene. So first, we're looking in, in, in wild-type Columbia. Columbia is what we call our wild-type plant. Why do we call it that? It was picked out of the ground in Columbia, Missouri. So in wild-type Columbia, this is our, our very healthy wild-type plant, all the transposable elements are silenced. They're not even expressing. The cell has identified them and shut them down. 
so they're not creating any kind of harm. Therefore, uh, this gene's RNA can accumulate at a, at a high level, and here that is, and we've set that arbitrarily to 1.0, right? as the level of this RNA, that's our baseline. Now this is the cool thing that we can do in plants. We can use a trick to activate transposable elements, to make them all express. This is what would be totally lethal uh, in, in a primate, for example. And this is a particular mutation, I'm not, I don't, I'm not gonna talk about it, but what it results in is transposable element expression, the RNA. That RNA, as I showed you re in the previous slide, is gonna be degraded by RNAi into small RNAs, and one of those small RNAs we thought matched this R mRNA, this genic RNA. And so what we saw was only about half as much uh, of a level of this RNA compared to uh, the previous example of wild type. So that told us that when transposable elements are active, this RNA accumulates less, this red RNA accumulates less. That's a correlation, right? When transposable elements get active, this gene's level of RNA goes down. And that's where if we were not in a model organism, we may have to stop. We either may have to stop there because there aren't the tools to go further, or it would take us a really long time and it would be very difficult to go the step further. But what we aim for in a model organism is scientific proof, airtight proof. And we can do that and we can do that quickly in model organisms. That's the power of them. So what do we do next? We use a double mutant where it's it has active transposable elements, transcriptionally active, meaning they're making RNAs, but it's mutant for RNAi, so it doesn't produce the small RNAs. And therefore, this genic RNA bounces back up to its normal expression level in wild type, right there. So that specifically tells us that it's not just transposable element expression, it's transposable element RNAs, small RNAs, that are specifically uh, regulating this mRNA. Okay, and lastly, and this is what we call the nail in the coffin experiment, the one that really shows um, uh, the mechanism, we're gonna use, again, active transposable elements that are making these small RNAs. And this small RNA should regulate this mRNA, like this mutant here, called DDM1, except we've added um, a special tool that I'm, I don't wanna go into what exactly this is, we call it an STTM. It's basically a molecular sponge and we can sponge out one specific RNA out of the pool of thousands of them, sponge that out of the cell, remove it from the equation, and when we remove that one small RNA, we see that the level of this RNA goes back up to its normal level. So we now not only understand that transposable element activity and expression is negatively correlated with the, trans with the genes level, we not only can tell that it's the small RNAs doing this, but we can actually tell which individual single small RNA it is regulating this uh, genic mRNA. And, that, and that's, that's the nail in the coffin, right? So we've gone through uh, many genes like this now in a recent publication using these small RNA sponges and individually picked out examples where we know that the transposable element picked up a piece of that gene and is now repressing that gene through RNAi. So if you missed all of that uh, data, here it is in cartoon form. So transposable elements hold gene fragments hostages, right? I showed you that the transposable element likes to incorporate pieces of different genes. Why is it incorporating these small pieces of genes? It's the robber, it's putting a gun to their head, right? It's saying, hey, if you silence me and silence me by, by, by RNAi, you're gonna have an off effect, an off target effect. Making the host silence its own essential genes as a cost of silencing the transposable element. So if this transposable element here produces an RNA, it's gonna look like this, it's gonna have regions that are similar to gene one, two, and three. And if the cell attacks this transcript by RNAi, it's gonna make small RNAs that look like this. And these small RNAs have the ability to go and regulate and, and destroy the transcripts from the genes which those little tiny fragments were stolen from. Basically, if the transposable, if the cell wants to silence this transposable element by RNAi, it's gonna to have to pay a penalty, and it's gonna to have to pay a penalty by now the fact that some of its genes are targeted by RNAi, which they normally shouldn't be. So remember, RNAi was this mechanism that the cell evolved to tell the, tran to tell the transposable elements and the virus apart from the transposable, or, or, apart from its normal genes. So it could tell 
what should be expressed from what should not be expressed. And here the transposable element is grabbing little fragments of genes saying, now I'm messing with your ability to tell what's what. Now you're gonna have to go silence your genes. So this is the molecular arms race that I want work on. Again, we're seeing this rapid escalation of traits and functions. We don't really use those words as much as mechanisms and pathways that each, the, 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 the cop in this case would be the plant cell or our cell and the robber, which is the transposable element, are evolving to try to outsmart each other. Now on the molecular level, uh, what's happening here is that the cop has picked up a, a tool and it evolved a tool called RNAi to degrade the RNAs from this transposable element. But the transposable element picked up a counter defense. And it picked up a counter defense incorporating little tiny fragments of these genes into the genome. And so we think we're just scratching the surface here. There's so much about the transposable element and, and the host genome that we see the transposable element doing something, but we don't understand why. But it's clearly doing it for a reason. So this is where we're going next with this research, is trying to use the transposable element to understand something about the host. My lab is really interested in these host defense mechanisms, but the transposable element allows us a way to really probe the host and really figure out how the host is functioning. So today, I, I, closing up this talk, I hope I've accomplished a couple things that I set out to do. I hope, one, I give you an appreciation of what all of our genomes are made out of. These are not sleek, genic machines that have been willed down to be as perfect as we think we are, right? These are bloated genomes that uh, happen to have some genes on them that we pass along from generation to generation in order to pass those genes. But there's lots of hitchhikers there, things called in, uh, uh, endogenous retroviruses I didn't even get to talk about, right? There's lots of stuff grabbing onto our genomes and being pulled through the generations. I hope I've explained what a transposable element is. They're the fragments of DNA. They make up 50% of our DNA. We probably should be aware of them. Um, and I've hopefully explained how important I think model organisms are. I think model organisms are uh, right at the, at the forefront right now in these arguments over what should be funded. Obviously, everybody wants to fund disease. That, that's what takes loved ones from us, and that's what uh, is, is most important. But I think there's also a big case here to also fund the model organisms, because that's how we as scientists can move the fastest. And if we really want innovation and discovery, we'll focus on those organisms. Uh, lastly, I hope I've explained these evolutionary concepts like arms races in a way um, that, using an analogy that, that, that we can all use, right? And my last thing I really wanted to do in the talk was show some published data, right? To, to, to show you how, uh, you know, even when um, I was being introduced and we talked about, you know, what's on my website of what I'm interested in, um, that's totally out there to most people. I'm writing that to a select few people trying to recruit them to my laboratory. But I think in a, even in a very short amount of time, I can explain what I do and get down to those kind of terms. And I think that's really important to come out and do. So I thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to answer any questions.